So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Ricky, my wife Carolyn, and uh, our youngest daughter Kelly, we're usually sitting here. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, retired from the Polk County Sheriff's Office, 25 years, 8 months, 15 days. <laughs> I retired yes. at 49 years old. <laughs> and we had a pretty good idea of what the budget would be and rebudgeted. Back up a second. I'm not used to being this close to the front. <laughs> Working at the jail every day of it in the sheriff's office. So every day I'm forced to interact with inmates, other, other jail officers, and friends on the street. And many of them have asked me, explain this Jesus thing, how does it work? Why do you believe? You can't see him, you can't feel him, you can't touch him. So I like talking about the blessings that he has bestowed on us. And that's what I want to share here. Back to the retirement. Um, we knew about what the budget would be, so we worked out a budget, retired. I want to stay out a year, two years, try to decide what I want to do from there. Well, they didn't tell us they were going to take a big hunk out of it because I was only 49. So it was a surprise. And therefore, the budget was gone. We're paying our tithe once a month because that's the way I get my check. First month, Carolyn's writing the tithe out Saturday night for church Sunday. And she comes to me and says, we're going to be $40 short. We hold a little back and make it up later or thought about a second said, well no we're gonna pay the whole thing and I remember in uh, Malachi pay the whole thing test me on it okay well, we're gonna test you we're gonna pay the whole time when it's only 40 bucks we got to. I mean if nothing else I can just not fill up the truck that's gonna save me about 40 bucks I just won't go anywhere Sunday came we paid the time in full Monday morning, in the mailbox, we get a check, $40, exact amount. It's from a credit card company that said we had overpaid them by 40 bucks. <laughs> but we've looked. We cannot find a second check. We can't find an $80 check for a $40 pay. It didn't happen. I know where it come from. Mm -hmm. But friends will say, it's just coincidence. Okay, let's go to the next month. Saturday, Carolyn's writing out the check. Now she's panicking. We're $140 short. Well, we're gonna pay the whole thing. We know what's gonna happen. And she's a little more skeptical than I can, so we have to work out how we're gonna make up at least some of it. Well, let me back up here again, because right before retirement, we bought a brand new set of tires for her vehicle. She needed it. First and only time we've ever used Tires Plus. Saturday, she writes out the check. Sunday, we get the check in, $140 short. Monday, in the mailbox, a check for $140. Exact amount, the day after. It's from Tires Plus, claiming it's an unscheduled, unadvertised company reimbursement for returning loyal customers. <laughs> Only time we ever use a store. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very loyal. Okay, Very somebody's loyal. made a mistake. <laughs> Friends, jailers, somebody's made a mistake. That's, that's twice so the second day. So let's go to the next month. Now I don't have to remember the exacts on this one because now it's funny. Now it's great. Now we're looking forward. <laughs> Saturday, getting ready to write the check. We're fifty dollars short. Cool. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And the guys at church know they're wanting to buy or rent the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> we got our check out for fifty dollars. Sunday we uh, put it in the timing plate. Monday in the mailbox, a check for fifty bucks. Fifty dollars. Test it. See what he'll do. We haven't busted the budget since. I haven't got any more checks in the mailbox since. <laughs> he took care of what we needed, when we needed it, yeah. and exactly how we needed it. Amen. Glory to God. And yes. we God. thank him every day for how good he's been to us. 
Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I see. I see you're here now. So. I'm trying to get you over. Either okay. way. All right. What do you want? Oh, well, since you appeared and, and I know that you've been busy, at, you, come on. Okay. All right. This is not Andy McGaffigan. This is Jill. <laughs> good the good looking one. I was doing breakfast over there in the building, so everybody's tummies are full. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't see your faces from this vantage point. It's not really nice. <laughs> All right. So um, I was raised in a Christian home. And there's really never a time in my life when I did not know God and did not know the love of Jesus because my parents were faithful followers who taught us how to read the Bible. We had, you know, family time every morning for breakfast before school, which I know is unheard of anymore, but that's how I was raised. And went to church, you know, regularly every Sunday and every time the doors were open, involved in the youth group. So really my life was full from the time I was born of learning about the love of God. But my parents were really good about also telling us that we were not Christ followers because they were, that we had to make a decision. So at the age of 12, I made a decision to follow Jesus. And I was raised Methodist, so I was baptized, but I was sprinkled. And um, <laughs> that was my decision to follow Christ. And so I continued to grow in my faith and continued in my teenage years. It does not mean I did not face the same challenges every other teenager faces, because I did. And sometimes I failed the challenges and sometimes I passed the challenges. But with each one, because my faith was strong, my foundation was strong, I was able to bounce back and realize, okay, that's called sin, you know, and I learned to address it. As I went into college, I knew that, um, you know, you're dating, you're, <laughs> I knew I wanted a man like my dad. I wanted someone who loved the Lord, who would lead our family in the way of Christ. And um, so I dated a few people, broke up with them because while they might have wanted to attend church with me, their heart was not there. But when I met my husband, I knew that he was a man of God. He had a reputation on campus. And my parents had taught me to pay attention to people's reputation. And I did. And um, so we, we obviously <laughs> married almost 43 years. And I'm so thankful that that has played out. He is, he is very much like my father has different strengths, but he loves the Lord. That does not mean that hard times haven't happened. Um, I faced cancer. Um, we faced challenges with raising children like everybody else does. We faced life challenges with jobs and so on. Um, some of them have been devastating. Um, getting a cancer uh, diagnosis shakes you, and you you all of a sudden don't know: Do I have another year or not? You know, it turned out God was gracious and provided for me to continue my future. But with each challenge we face, whatever it has been, it has always come back to that foundational truth that whether I understand God or not, I believe him. I believe who he is. I know because of my experiences in life that he is real. And I know that he will always be there with me no matter what I go through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And last but not least today, Miss Mimi. This is all new to me. That's good. <laughs> Bear with me. I'm a little nervous. Um, to make a long story short, I was adopted at the age of two. And I know that my mom really loved me a lot, but she had a very rough way of teaching me as a child. As a child. She was very heavy handed and really, if, I, if she would do this today, she would have been in jail. Um, so we had our outs and um, we had spent two years without talking to each other. I, I decided to say I'm going to wash my hands, I'm done with it. So after the two years, she followed me into a shopping strip and she came and knocked on my door, on the glass door. I just opened up a little bit because I was afraid she was, well, she's done it before, put her hand inside and then grab me by my hair and snatch it. And she says, don't worry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hate you or anything. I says, what do you want? And I'm looking straight ahead. And she started kneeling and she said, I just wanna ask you for your forgiveness. And look, I'm kneeling down. I think I told her, I said, you know what? I'm no one for you to kneel, to ask for forgiveness and kneel to me. And I just kept, you know, firm because I, I I was upset, I was mad. And she says, maybe let's, she said, let's give it another chance and, and this and that. I said, I don't know, I don't know, time would tell. She says, well, can I have a kiss? You know, firm. 
So we'll think about it on that. Yeah, okay. Put me in this. Turn on the car. The first things that came, the first words that came out of that red radio station was, if you want to learn, if you want to cover yourself with God's coat, you need to learn how to forgive. That came right there, and I'm like, and I've heard that people <coughs> tell me that God talks to you in different ways. I never believed it until that day. I was like, wow. So I decided to listen to him, and I called her, and uh, we became, kind of rekindled slowly but surely, and that's the best decision I made because those were the last two months she spent in this world. Mm. She got very sick. I, went to, I took her home. I took care of her. I bathed her. I fed her. Yeah. And on the last day, she said she was very little bit sad. I said, Mom, what's wrong? And she says, I want to go home. I said, okay, I'll take you home, no problem. So she always loved that uh, soup from Pollo Tropical, so I got her that. Took her home, gave her a bath, fed her, gave her insulin, and laid her, laid her down. And that was the last time she was in this earth. Mm -hmm. And I thank God that he gave me those two months, because if not, I would have never forgiven myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Now, everybody's got a story to tell. Everybody's got a purpose for being here in this congregation. And your story is going to lead to somebody hearing about Jesus. That's the whole point of sharing this exercise. This is how God expects us to interact with other people. We tell what God has done for us. We say, come and see that the Lord is good. The Lord has been good to all of us. The Lord has been good to Ricky to, to, to um, Andy and Jill, it's been good to Mimi, and he's constantly using the situations in our lives to give us a story to tell. We, we often say that the story of the New Testament is one of rebirth, but what we sometimes find it hard to grasp is that the story of the New Testament continues today with what we say, with what we do, with how we interact with the world. God's kingdom is still breaking forth onto this earth, and we're a part of that. We still have a story to tell. So, the church begins part two. I've got to uh, get through two sheets of lessons you've got front and back. I've got my two side by side here. Um, looking at the time, I don't expect to get entirely through, and I may stop early just so that we don't get too far ahead because there are some stuff that I really, really want us to kind of drill in on. But I am gonna stick tight to the sheet today, more so than I probably have done before. I've got, I've got some notes here, where are my notes? I don't wanna forget those. That, about specific things that I wanna hit on. Uh, but I also wanna stick close to the, to the worksheet today. Before okay. you get started, I just want everybody to know I talked with Tim Stein this morning, and he says it's just a matter of days for Bonnie. Oh, oh. Yeah. okay. So Thank you. Thank you for that. Let everybody know that so that you're in prayer for him. And, and for the signs, yeah. He's getting Absolutely. choked up talking to him. Oh, so my goodness. I, right. I haven't been there in the last few days, but I don't know. Okay. So, wow. So, that's, uh, we've been, I've been seeing the, the news. She's, been, she's, she's home with hospice. She's, uh, you know, as comfortable as you can get, I guess. Uh, it's always strange to me to think about such things you know, in terms of comfort and everything. But, uh, I hate to hear that. Well, we do have good news though. And the good news is that we have eternal life in Jesus and we have to share that with the world. Now, before we get into the lesson, let's think very briefly about two particular things. Uh, there's a lot of action that's going on in the book of Acts. Right now, the action is centering around Peter and the other apostles in the city of Jerusalem. This is where they're located. This is part of the formula, if such a word can really be applied, that Jesus gave the apostles uh, shortly before he ascends into heaven. He says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in Judea, in the rest of the world. So they are there. They're in Jerusalem. Actually, I think I got that wrong. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. Um, but they, uh, uh, the point is that... They are still in Jerusalem right now. And they're experiencing some growing pains, some very interesting growing pains. Number one, Peter has some high-profile high confrontations with the leadership in town, in Jerusalem. 
Uh, he has some confrontations with the high priest. He's arrested. He's released. He's arrested again. He walks out of prison, released by God. You know, and and, um, and uh, the the this this is this is seen as being a very very big deal to these people. Um, so they're having a brief spell of growing pains uh, and, and dealing with the government, and dealing with their local church, so to speak. Because at this point in time, everybody that's a Christian right now, everybody that's among these followers of the way, as they're known as, everyone who's a disciple of this Jesus of Nazareth, they're all Jews. They're all Jewish. So their idea of church is synagogue on Saturday. Their idea of the community of faith and of believers are the people who go to the temple and offer sacrifices and worship. And they're transitioning within their minds, going from a, a blood sacrifice of lambs to a knowledge that the blood sacrifice of Jesus is good enough for all of our sins. So they're going through a little bit of growing pains. And then we come to Acts chapter 6, and we start to experience some more growing pains. Everybody read their homeworks, Acts 6, 7, and 8. Everybody get that done? What's the, what's the big theme of Acts chapter 6? What's going on in this chapter? The choosing of the deacons. Choosing of the deacons, yes. The choosing of the seven. Mm -hmm. All right. It, it, it all starts with a problem, right? What's our problem in verse 1 and 2? There's really two things that I want us to kind of look at here uh, that are problematic. Inequality. Inequality, right? And, um, and specifically, uh, let me see, where's Bible actual... Carl, can you reach in that bag right there and hand me that black? Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Chapter 5. Bible Actual. Thank you. This is Bible Actual. Okay. Uh, physical copy of the scriptures that I love to have with me. Um, it goes anywhere. It's made of paper that's endurable. I bought it as the, I hope to be the last Bible that I would ever buy. You know, we'll see. I say. Kelly, Kelly says, Kelly's looking at me with skepticism because... Yeah, a little tape on the binding, right? Yeah. So, uh, but this is Bible Actual, as opposed to Bible Virtual, which is eSword, the Sword of the Lord with an electronic edge. Download your copy, Mimi's figured it out, and uh, it's, she's having fun with that, I hope. And um, it's a great, uh, great tool. It's got some great study helps. You get the ESV with it for free, which is, you know, choice. That's uh, what we're using in class here. But uh, a lot of things go on good with that. It says, Now in those days the disciples were increasing in number. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Okay, now, there's some growing pains that the church is experiencing. Number one, there's a conflict. Some people, they feel like they're being left out. The apostles do not leave this issue unaddressed, but it raises for them another problem. The apostles have a job to do, okay? And the apostles' job is to basically to teach the people the things that Jesus taught them. Now, they do that through example and through their words, but they also need them, the people, to also learn to do the things that Jesus did through example and through their words. And that's what we're going to see in the book of Acts chapter 6. We're going to see an example of people being chosen from in and amongst the believers. They, 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 there are going to be a group of people that are chosen from in and amongst the believers to do some of the things that Jesus did. Uh, think about it. What were some of the things that Jesus did? When, or, or, or I could I could ask you like this: When the John's disciples were sent by John when John was in prison to Jesus to ask them, "Are you the one, or should we wait for another?" What were the things that were said? The blank and he wasn't that he was preparing the way. Healing. Yeah, healing. The, the blind could see, the deaf could hear, the lame could walk. The dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. It's always very interesting to me that they add on the good news is preached to the poor, in addition to all these other things that we consider to be miraculous, that we don't necessarily see, you know, directly done today. I've never seen anybody raised from the dead, but I've seen good news preached to the poor. It's very interesting, very interesting. 
Um, this is what he that what they're trying to that the apostles aren't just trying to pass the buck. They're trying to get the people to see this is as much your job as it is ours. This is work that we share with you. We don't just do it by ourselves. And we have a specific thing that we are uniquely qualified to do as witnesses to the resurrection. So you guys need to pick up the slack. Within the kingdom of God, uh, well, I think we've heard it said before, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. There is an inversion of responsibilities, a mixing up of priorities that, 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 we, need to, that we need to grasp and consider. And consider. Andy. Yeah, you, you had made a, you had used the phrase picking up the slack. I think it, I would phrase that that you as a member of the body of Christ have a job too. Mm -hmm. And it's very important. It's just as important. It's different, but just as important. And, you know, I've been in leadership for many years and, and I've been in a lot of different churches over my lifetime as a, as a believer. And I've seen circumstances where uh, like somebody might be in the in the hospital and they get upset because the pastor didn't come to see them. Well, in years gone by, the pastor did everything, and that's why they burned out and and, and flamed out so so uh, often. But and and this person specifically, the one I'm thinking about, left the church because the pastor didn't come visit them. How, however five, six, seven, eight, ten other members of the body had visited this person and ministered to this person, but this person had this mentality that that was the pastor's job. And that's, but there, there's nowhere, I mean, that's a that's a modern day uh, thing, but I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying here because we are the church. We exactly. Are the body of yeah. Exactly. And I've been in I've been in churches I've been in churches too, Andy, where um, where like you said, only only the pastor has been involved in doing that. And when the pastor doesn't, the members don't, and that's not right. We have to, as the as the body of Christ, understand that it's our job to do these things to, to go to the sick, to yeah. go to those who have need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just this is just goes back to the. the you know the, the scriptural truth that the uh, the leaders of the church are to edify the body. They're supposed to teach the body, to train the body to do the work of the church. And in as Andy pointed out, so many people want it to be done by the clergy. It's their job to do it. It's not the job of the individuals. No. It's the job of the individuals in but, the church. But if, uh, but if you're in Jim's class on Wednesday night, what do we learn? We are the priesthood. We are the royal priesthood. We are the royal priesthood. Yes. Go. And most of the time we know everywhere, not only in church, okay, that the, the person that most criticizes is the person that does the less. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. do the less. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know what this person, okay, that left church because the pastor didn't, how many people did she or he visited exactly. as a member of the church? Well, I, I can't say specifically, but you're right. It, it was this person's misdirected uh, uh, thoughts that, you know, that the pastor does everything. Yeah. And, and, and that's just, you know, I always joke around with the pastor. I say, well, you only work one, maybe two days a week. <laughs> <laughs> Which we all know is crazy. Exactly. Yeah. You only work on Sundays. Yeah. Right. Joe, what you got to add? Well, I was just going to say, I love this topic, and, and I think it goes along just remembering that we all have different gifts, too. We've all been gifted to do different things. Yeah. The pastor does not have every gift. And so, as a body of Christ, we're called to, as you're saying, collectively do the work of the church. We are the church, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, the problem is. There's people who feel neglected and who need to have their needs addressed. Sure. And let's let's think for a minute. Let's think back. This is still not long after the church's inception. At the church's inception, a lot of the people that were there, a lot of these would have been, the, especially among the Hellenist crowd, um, would have been basically on vacation when they came to the Lord. And they may maybe this is uh, I, I would try to figure out the exact timing of when this would have occurred. I think that this is still fairly new. 
within the, the church's uh, inception. So a lot of these people were like day one Christians, I think. And a lot of this group were day one Christians. And they didn't have the support built in to where they were. So they're depending upon the apostles, upon the people who were selling goods and, 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 and distributing among them. They're, they're dependent on that for their living because their living is still back wherever they came from. It, sound, it seems, seems like they're growing quickly. Mm -hmm. and, it, and they're trying to take the opportunity to kind of make sure they manage the expect, you know, like manage who are we? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just think that problem comes along with <clears throat> growth, right. that quick growth. So, so we have people identifying a solution to the problem. And who identifies the solution? The 12. The 12, the apostles. Mm -hmm. their, their identification of the solution, though, is make it your problem, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> guys, this is your problem. You guys saw this. Choose from amongst yourself people. And whenever you make this choice, we will appoint them to do this work. All right? So did these chosen men, did they, 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 they uh, concern themselves only with the administration of food no. during the daily allotment? No. They did not. They did not. Um, what else did they do? Well, Stephen was performing great wonders and signs, so he was obviously doing miraculous things. Mm -hmm. Might be healing, uh, yeah. things along that nature. No. In other words, he's carrying, he's carrying the grace of God and mm -hmm. the advancement of the kingdom with him. Mm -hmm. All right, and um, specifically, how, are the, how did the apostles tell the people to identify those men uh, within them? Let me see here. Yeah. Verse 3. Full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Good reputation, full mm -hmm. of the Spirit and of wisdom. A good yeah. reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and they, they have some wisdom. They have a little bit of wisdom. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've been told that... Uh, Wisdom comes from uh, uh, bad choices. Is that right? <laughs> Experience. Yeah. Experience. Yeah. Experience. Yeah. yeah it's like it's like wisdom comes from experience. Experience comes from bad choices. How's it? How's it go? I don't know. Uh, but these people were identified based on who they were uh, from within the congregation. The, 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 I think that's important. Some people make a big deal out of the fact that these men had Greek names, so they would have been from among Hellenist believers themselves. Uh, personally, I see this as, a, as an adventure and sort of missing the point. The point is, is that these men were chosen because of their qualifications. They had a good reputation. They had wisdom. They, had, they were full of the Holy Spirit. They, they were doing the things basically that the, the that the apostles expected of them. Yeah, and being full of the Holy Spirit, you know, meant that the wisdom came from the Holy Spirit. Their experience, you know, you can have experiences and not have those experiences be applied appropriately in light of the world. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. we all have experiences, but do I take my experiences and allow God to teach me through them? Right. And so all of that that you're listing comes from their relationship with the Holy Spirit, which is why I think that it was pointing out being full of the Holy Spirit was a criteria, right? Right. Yeah. Also, Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, could do a miracle. That's right. It was the Holy Spirit. That's right. That so was, was doing it through Peter. Through, through Peter. Peter, yeah. And mm -hmm. Stephen, yeah, and many others. Yeah. So we can't get away from, I mean, I know you said that, but we can't get away from, that's kind of the, to me, that's the umbrella that everything else comes <coughs> from, right? The Holy Spirit's first, and then the experiences are applied in a God-honoring way, the Wisdom comes, all the other things. Exactly. Yeah. And I love that verse. It says, "And the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is dwelling in us and quickening us." Yes. You know, leading and guiding us in all truth. Like That's right. Jesus couldn't do it without the Holy Spirit. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit. That's right. Amen. All right. So we have several players that are involved here. All right. We have the apostles, and the apostles say two seven. So we have the seven. So we have the apostles. We have twelve. We have seven, and then we have some other players that are that are at work in Acts chapter six that are that are um, that are bringing us to a point, bringing things to a head. Who are these players? The members of the body, the members of the different groups. Is that what you mean? The, the oh well, I mean we do have we do have the, the church, the church at yeah. large. Yeah. But uh, who else do we have? Priests. The priests. Many priests are coming. 
That's often been overlooked here. Yeah, many of the priests who were coming and, and, and believing. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Right at the end of the chapter, there we have we have we have a situation. We have a situation that's developing. What's the situation that's developing? Oh, the trial of uh, the the arrest of Stephen. Yeah. The, 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 the arrest of Stephen and who, who led to the arrest of Stephen? This, uh, the, it, well, it wasn't the same. Uh, it was the synagogue of the freedmen. Synagogue of the freedmen. Very good. Synagogue. It was not the Sanhedrin. The freedmen. Yeah, I know. It's not readable. <laughs> not legible. But, synagogue uh, of the fried. Mm -hmm. Is that the synagogue of the fried? Yes, synagogue of the fried. <laughs> yes. There you go. I ran out. I ran out of space. Okay. That's probably. I mean, if they didn't repent, yeah, yeah. that's what happened to them. <laughs> if, if you don't repent, yeah, that's your choice, right? Yeah, you become the synagogue, the, the collection of the fried. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, so we have these people that are involved. Uh, the synagogue of the freedmen. Remember that these are Jews. Jews, when they go to church, they go to church on Saturday. And the Christians were doing the same. They were going with the Jews to their church on Saturday. And in the process of uh, their lesson learning, the Christians would attempt to use the scripture. Uh, we're gonna see this pattern by Paul in particular. They're gonna use the scripture to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And in the learning that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, in the proving of the scripture, more people are going to believe. But in this situation, people begin to oppose. And so we have a difference. And Stephen finds himself, before not a crowd of people who are there to worship God as part of a festival like Peter did on Pentecost, but before the Sanhedrin. So in some ways, this is more like the incident with Jesus than it was with Peter. But there are some things that make this very similar to what Peter's um, thing was. And that's when we get into Acts chapter 7. So, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen gives us a sermon, right? It's a rather, uh, rather interesting sermon because he basically takes them through the entirety of uh, history of the Hebrew people. He shows them basically, this is your history. This is our history as Jews. This is the history that we have and everything's been leading up to a point. And uh, so how is this sermon similar then to, uh, to Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. So there may be a stretch. Well, it's scriptural. The scriptural base. He does a lot of scripture quoting, right? Mm -hmm. Scripture comes out of Stephen and, 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 is put it, and is put before the people. Right. Right? And so that's one of my big, uh, my big uh, uh, bully whips that I keep telling you guys is that the more scripture we put in that, the more it's going to come out of us. The more it's going to be ready and available within us to come out when the time is necessary. So put scripture in, in you. That's, a, that's what we want to do. That's why we do our little, um, everybody have our, our um, I don't have the, the thing with me, but make sure you get your uh, practice sheet. We have a new scripture to memorize. It sometimes is called the key verse of the gospel. It's, the, it's the, 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 the easiest way to tell people what the gospel message is. If you ever need to think, what's the gospel message? Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, he rose again on the third day. This is promised according to scripture. That's the, that's the simplest way to tell somebody. For what I received, I delivered unto you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scripture. And whenever, what Peter, what Peter did on the day of Pentecost is he showed that this was the case. He used scripture to show that this is what you should have been looking for. Same thing happens with Stephen. Stephen said, Stephen uses scripture. It comes out of him. And he shows the Sanhedrin. This is what you should have been looking for. Now there's some big differences too. What are some of the big differences? Between uh, what Stephen said and what Peter said. Well, let's start with, uh, let's start with, the, with the end here. What was the result of Stephen's sermon? He was stoned. He got He's stoned to death. Anybody ever had a preacher they wish they could stone uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he directly calls them murderers. Well, I mean, both of them kind of do that, though. What did, how, did, how, did, how did Peter say it? God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Maybe it's just the way they translate it. 
translated it, but condom and a murder is a little harsher than <laughs> saying this is the one you crucified. I don't know. They're both murder. Are you saying that it's easier? It's, it's a little harder to take? Yeah, I, 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 I see saying that. He might have used a word that was a little more. Uh, in your face, yeah. Uh -huh. In your face, yeah. In your face, a little bit more confrontational. Yeah. Stephen, Stephen told them they were against God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They thought they were the ones who were closest to God, and he says, "You're wrong. You are against God." He says, "You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit." Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. He is a lot more direct <laughs> in addressing these people, in particular. Now, when Peter, Peter addresses the whole nation in some ways, but Stephen's sermon is against the leadership of the nation of Israel. Israel is coming to the end of its service before God. In some ways, the fuse has been lit and it's burning down. And they are sitting at a point halfway between the coming of Jesus and, and, and the fall of the temple in Jerusalem. That's about where they are timeline-wise. They are in the middle of it all. They are, they are halfway between the time when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is coming, whenever he says, I come to, uh, uh, if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it again in three days. And they thought he was talking about the real temple. They even mentioned that, that this Jesus said he was going to do this. But he says, no, it's not really what's going to happen here, guys. What's going to happen is I'm going to die, be buried, and rise again. That's what he was talking about. He's talking about the temple of his body. And uh, this temple right here, not one stone is going to be left another, and it's not going to be built again. It's not going to be raised up again. And uh, historically, that has proven to be the case. Uh, so, in an important way that they're different, yeah, that is a lot different. Uh, how did the people respond to Stephen's message? They don't think they killed him. They killed him. <laughs> they killed him. They didn't like it very much. Yeah, they didn't like it. <laughs> Uh, they, they truly were a stiff-necked people with an uncircumcised heart. Um, they were not receptive. Before he started the message, before he started preaching that big message, they stirred up, they actually created lies. Mm -hmm. Slanderous lies about him saying, he just said Jesus would have come and destroyed his place and destroyed the history of Moses and all this stuff. And they were just trumping up a bunch of false claims. And and it's funny it's funny that that they did that because they did the same thing to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Basically, the accusations that they make against Stephen were very similar to the accusations that they made against Jesus. Jesus did teach, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it again in three days. But he wasn't talking about the temple in Jerusalem. He was talking about the temple of his body. Mm -hmm. Jesus did teach that you know in a, he did teach a resurrection, and, and um, that's very important for the for the people there. That was very important for the people there. All right. Uh, what other ways did they? Uh, uh, let's see here. They were enraged. And this is this is a point that I wanted to make: is that these people, when they heard the words of Jesus, they were enraged. They were not cut to the heart. Mm -hmm. They did not say, "What shall we do?" Yeah. They said. We're going to kill you. They were enraged, Jill. You know, when you've done something wrong and somebody calls you out on it, if you're not ready to repent, what do you do? You get defensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's just a natural human response to an accusation you don't want to hear. They clearly weren't ready to hear it and repent. Mm -hmm. you know? They weren't ready to so repent. So they got defensive in a mighty way. <laughs> <laughs> a mighty way indeed. Any questions so far? Well, they broke the law in their response too because they weren't allowed to kill people at that point. When, they, when Jesus was killed, the, the council, the Sanhedrin, went to Pilate and said, we need you to execute this man mm -hmm. because we don't, can't do it. But these right. people took the law right into their own hands. They stoned him. Do you think, Brandon, in that final verse, y'all, um, when Stephen says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, and it's similar to what Christ says, right? Mm -hmm. But do you think the Lord will not hold that sin against them because he said that? Because he made that request? Or is that more of a statement of some sort? Well, okay, so now I have to get into my notes a little bit more. 
And this is part of the reason why I was wanting to go to KX. Okay, good. Thank you for asking that because that brings up another day if you want. But no, no. This, 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 this is this is part of the reason why I was thinking that I didn't want to necessarily cover Acts eight today because that's a very important, very important statement, very important note. Um, let's look pragmatically at what's going on in the bigger picture here. The church had growing pains. Things are happening in Jerusalem at an exponential work. But Jesus needs them to get out of Jerusalem. He needs them to go from Jerusalem into Judea, into Samaria, and then points beyond. But the people are happy to stay exactly where they are because they're having their needs met. They have the apostles teaching right there. In some ways, they're a little, what we like to say in the agricultural business, root bound. Anybody ever deal with a root-bound plant? Mm -hmm. What happens? Plant gets put in its pot, it only grows to a certain size because it doesn't have space to expand its roots and get out. It gets root-bound. And a plant can get so root-bound, it'll only ever be a tiny plant for the rest of its life. The Japanese do this on purpose, they call it bonsai. A lot of people don't realize that the, the whole point of bonsai isn't necessarily you know, trimming the limbs, you actually have to get in there and stuff the roots because that's where the, the plant finds its strength in its size and its development. How do you spell roots? Yeah, <laughs> roots. Like, roots. Like, roots. R O O T S. The roots. 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 R O O T S. The roots. The roots. <laughs> Listen now, my grandpa used to say doit, and I would, it took me forever to figure out when he was saying doit, he was talking about dirt. <laughs> <laughs> that doit right over there, he'd say, and I'd be like, what on earth is doit? <laughs> so, hey, that's an aside. Um, <laughs> so hard to get learned, right? <laughs> hey, man, you I'm know. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Different okay. dialogue. Exactly, Other exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's a need, in other words, for these people to get out of Jerusalem. And I think that, that God is using this situation with Stephen to catapult the church out of the pot, chop off the roots. That's what you got to do when you got a root-bound plant. You got to you got to cut them. You got to chop. You got to chop the edges off a little bit so they have some space to grow. Put them in a new pot and then, and then put them in a bigger area so they can expand. Bigger pot. So they got to get out of the city. Mm -hmm. Now they're root-bound um, in the city. It's the believers who are doing this, <laughs> and that's also important. Uh, uh, that's also important to me because uh, we're going to see that the apostles kind of stay behind. But the believers, the other believers are the ones that go. And who among the seven, I mean, I mean, the people chose from themselves the seven that were going to be the administrators of this, of this distribution of food. So the, the, there's a very real sense in which the apostles are saying, you guys have to take the message with you. We're going to stay right here because we still have our work to do until at least the time the temple is gone, completely over with and completely kaput. We've got people that are coming here. Uh, we want everybody to be able to find us. I think that was another reason why the apostles were wanting to stay behind at this time was that they wanted people to be able to find us. And um, the, the message itself needs to expand. And we're gonna go, eventually they do leave and they do go. And that's what we see in Acts chapter eight. I think that there's something there I'm thinking about that I think is important for us to think about that the circumstances is what ended up driving them out. And something, is, and that is similar to what we go through. Occasionally, opportunity will be the thing that moves the gospel forward. But oftentimes, it is troubled circumstances. This is a troubled circumstance here. Paul had opportunity in Rome, but that was a troubled circumstance. He goes to Rome because he has been taken prisoner. Mm -hmm. We don't like that, but it seems to be a part of how God moves the kingdom to different places. Not necessarily good, positive, happy, open doors, but yeah, mm -hmm. they're, they're moved through un unfortunate circumstances. 
Right, and we're going to get into that a little bit here. I do want to touch on, on a couple of questions here from Acts chapter 8, and the rest of them we're going to cover uh, next week. That'll be fine. You'll still get new homework, uh, and we'll be able to get through everything next week. Uh, but we want to talk very briefly about what was the result of Stephen's death. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Paul and Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay? I want you to think about this for a minute. The church, this, this, this goes to why I think Stephen said, don't hold this against them. Because I think Stephen had the bigger picture in mind. I think that Stephen understood that we've got to get out of Jerusalem. We've got to go into Judea. We've got to go into Samaria. But how are we going to do this? People are comfortable here. It's time for all of us to get out of our comfort zone a little bit and to push ourselves out from this city. Because Jerusalem is no longer the center of the world. The center of the world is, is Christ. The center the, we, we must be focused about Christ. We do not go to Jerusalem to worship and pray, but the kingdom is within us. And we have to take that out. We have to tell the people this is what's going on. There are people in our area who've heard of Jesus, but they don't know that he died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. We need to go to them and tell them in Judea. We need to go to the village where the woman at the well was waiting in Samaria. And we need to tell those people that Jesus has died for their sins and was buried and rose again. And that you no longer come to Jerusalem. Because remember, Jesus and this woman had an exchange that, that where, where, because uh, it was over this religious differences that they had between them. But now Jesus has taken that away. And they need the good news. They need to know that they can come to Jesus. And once they come to Jesus, the whole of the world needs to understand the messages for them as well. So the result of Stephen's death is that a great persecution arises, people leave the city. The apostles stay behind, but the people from among whom seven were chosen to do the work of the Lord go with them as well. They leave, they go. Now some of these people, I think, have been in Jerusalem since day one. And they're going to go back to their home. They're going to go back to Rome. They're going to go back to Cyrenia. They're going to go back to wherever it is they came from, to Asia. And they have the gospel that they're taking with them. And that's what we're going to get into a little bit next week with the life and testimony of Paul. Um, so next week we're going to finish out this, so make sure you keep your sheet. Um, uh, we also have Acts 9. Uh, Acts 22 and Acts 26 to read and familiarize yourself with this we're going to be focusing on specifically Paul's testimony uh, uh, Paul's conversion Saul's conversion he's called Saul right here in Acts chapter uh, in Acts chapter 8 Saul was there giving approval to this he's literally you know collecting the codes for those people who are actually committing the act meaning that he's acting as the, the, the watch out and the, and the lookout guy making sure that this thing gets done. And he himself is going to take up the role of a lead persecutor. Somebody who is zealous for God to the point where he's willing to skirt around the orders and, and rule of Rome and do what he thinks is right based on what the temple and the priests have instructed him to do. Uh, we got our new memory verse. Everybody's got their new copy of the memory verse. Yeah. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I think I did notice a typo on the sheet. It says 44. Um, delivered to me. Verse 44. I don't, even think, I don't even think there's 44 verses in there. That's 4. It's supposed to be just one. Well, you just put 15, 3, 4. But I also 15, 3, and 4 at the top. Yeah. So. That Christ died for our sins. <laughs> we have that to, to work on. Testimony next week, like I said. I've got uh, I've got one signed up. I got Terry signed up for next week. Uh, so we got two more spaces available for next week if you're ready. Now that you've seen uh, Jill, Mimi, and um, and Craig do it, we um, uh, oh Ricky, I'm sorry, not Craig. I don't know why I called you Craig. Um, and Ricky do it. What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that you guys kind of see how it does, you know that you're not alone and it's easy and you can get it done. Yes, Jill. I just have to make one um, addendum to my testimony real fast. I told you I was sprinkled when I was baptized, but at the age of 30, I had never been taught about immersion. 
I just want you to know, at the age of 30, I was sat under a teaching where I learned about immersion, and I was immersed at the age of 30. I just want you to know that the Holy Spirit convicted actually Andy and myself then, and we, we were immersed in baptism. I want to say that. I also want to say, um, y'all are our family. That, that's one thing that I want to connect to my testimony, is that we don't have family. Our parents have been dead a long time, and no, no family here. And the, our church is our family. And so with all the bumps, and like we were talking earlier about people getting angry here, you know, we feel like family has worse. Family does things wrong and it hurts you. And to me, this is my family, and I won't leave this family unless they're preaching something other than the truth from the pulpit. Um, finally, Andy and I are going to be gone the next four weeks, so don't think we've left the church. <laughs> We're be, uh, actually, in North Carolina, um, having some time up there. So I just want you to know we're going to you guys. Well, enjoy your vacation. <laughs> ought to be ought to be beautiful up there at right, this time of year, right? Yeah. yeah. That'll be a good time. Good time. All right. I have a speaking engagement on Saturday in Tennessee at a women's retreat, so you can be keeping me in prayer for that. That's okay. what's going to start the trip. But... Start the trip. Man. Well, cool. Be up there. Gone for four weeks. All right. Well, I know Andy's going to be spending part of that time in a stand somewhere. Oh, absolutely. Chasing a white tail. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going to be chasing. <laughs> it's going to be late. All right. Well, thank you guys. Let's uh, be dismissed in prayer, and then uh, we'll be we'll be done. I think I made it on time. Pray for all you in prayer. Yes. Father God, thank you for the testimony of your word. Thank you for the testimony of those who came before us, for Stephen, for Peter, for the apostles. Uh, their testimony, Father, has led to life for us today. We wish to continue our testimony uh, so that others may have life as well. We ask, Father, that you be with uh, uh, Bonnie and her family, uh, for, for the whole Stein family. Father, as, uh, as Bonnie ends the, enters the final phases of this life, Father, that you, would, that you would comfort them, that you would give them strength through their, through their time of need. And Father, don't let them worry, but Father, be, be an ever-present comfort for them. Father, may we be a comfort as well. May we always show the, them the love that they need during this time. And Father, just uh, always keep us mindful of our jobs to do within the church. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good Thank job. Thank you for your testimony. Oh, it was you're wonderful. welcome. It was wonderful. Uh, it's